Hi there. Thanks for joining us. This is the latest episode of Space Nuts. My name is Andrew Dunkley, your host. It's so good to have your company. Today, we are going to look uh, pretty close to home at our own atmosphere because they've made a fascinating discovery. It looks like Earth cleans up its act, which is good, uh, but they've found a, a mechanism that uh, wasn't previously known, which is really quite fascinating. And we're going to look at Neptune because uh, the James Webb Space Telescope recently took some uh, happy snaps of Neptune, and it is quite astounding. Uh, on top of all that, we're going to answer questions we've never had asked before. You don't believe me. Uh, somebody wants to rewrite Big Bang Theory. Uh, there's also a question about the expansion of the universe and dark matter. Never done that before. That's all coming up on this edition of Space Nuts. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4. Three, two, one, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And joining me to get down and dirty with Uranus and uh, clean it all up with Earth's atmosphere is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. We've been doing this too long, Andrew, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Anyway, well, yes, it's great to be here. Um, it's good to have you here. It's good to have you here. Yes. Um, yes, we, we will um, probably just plough straight into it today because there's uh, plenty to talk about. And I'm really fascinated by this first story about uh, how Earth's atmosphere, atmosphere cleans itself because uh, we, we've been talking for decades now about how filthy our atmosphere is and how much dirtier it's getting and what that uh, means for global warming and climate change and the melting of the ice caps and dogs and cats living together. But this dis this discovery could change the game. Uh, yeah, it, it, that's right. It, it certainly changes the game in terms of our understanding of what's happening in the Earth's atmosphere. And you know, um, what's that got to do with astronomy? Well, first of all, the Earth is a planet, and we we learn things about planets by looking at the way things happen on Earth. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, of course, is that astronomers, at least ground based astronomers, are always looking through the atmosphere. <laughs> So it's quite important to us. Uh, and that's why I thought this story was one that we uh, was w worthy of uh, a Space Nuts uh, feature. Yes. And um, it comes from research that has been published uh, in the United States in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, it's uh, uh, the researchers are essentially chemists uh, at uh, University College, uh, sorry, University of California, Irvine. So What's the story? Okay, it's about hydroxide, which is a, a sort of two-atom uh, two molecule related to water, but it isn't water. It's O and H stuck together. And of course, water is ah. H2 and O stuck together. Uh, but this o OH is a molecule that um, in some sense is, un is un unstable, but it binds with other molecules. That's its great thing. It's uh, very, very um, gregarious. It likes to be with other compounds. And that's why it has a role in cleaning up the atmosphere um, because um, a lot of hydrocarbons in particular uh, actually react with OH uh, and basically turn into stuff that's okay, like water. Yeah. Uh, and, um, the, you know, one of, one of the authors of this paper says uh, you need OH to oxidize hydrocarbons, otherwise they will build up in the atmosphere indefinitely, and that would not be a good thing. Definitely so, not. That'd be runaway greenhouse, wouldn't it? Uh, it, it, it yes, in, in the end, it would lead to, you know, an increase in greenhouse gases. So um, the lead author of this study, uh, a person called Christian George, I assume that's how you pronounce it, Andrew, because... Uh, Christian is an atmospheric chemist at the University of Lyon, which is in France, of course. Uh, and Christian says, OH, uh, that's this strange little uh, little uh, molecule, OH is a key player in the story of atmospheric chemistry. It initiates the reactions that break down airborne pollutants and helps to move to remove noxious chemicals such as sulfur dioxide and nitric oxide, which are poisonous gases from the yeah. atmosphere. Uh, thus, having a full understanding of its sources and sinks is a key to understanding and mitigating air pollution. So that's the link with uh, with why why we're able to clean up the planet's atmosphere. Uh, 
Um, and uh, it's it, it, so the way we've always thought OH was formed in the atmosphere was by the by sunlight, by mm. ultraviolet radiation from the sun triggering a reaction that forms OH. Um, and so it's always been thought that you've got to have sunlight to make this this stuff. Um, but it turns out that um, there is another way, which may actually be the you know in in many ways the principal way. It might actually be sunlight as the uh, the main mechanism for creating. <clears throat> excuse me for creating OH. Excuse me one moment. Thank you. <clears throat> it's the um, frog in the throat syndrome. Here we go. Yeah. Sorry, the OH molecule in the throat syndrome. There probably is one somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> it builds on. So it builds on uh, earlier work. Um, uh, another group, um, in fact, at Stanford University in the USA, uh, they discovered that uh, if you've got water droplets just sort of hanging around in in a lab, uh, you can get hydrogen peroxide, which is another molecule forming on these water droplets. It's formed spontaneously. Mm. And that was the work that triggered the research that we're reporting now uh, because it's um, not hydrogen peroxide that these uh, uh, scientists are looking at. It's OH, the hydroxide. Uh, so um, what they did was they got a lot of different containers, uh, some which contain droplets of water with air and some that contain water without any air <laughs> oh. so it's it's vaporized water effectively and they looked at the production of the hydroxide molecule uh, and what they saw was that in the ones in darkness um, in fact they're all in darkness actually they're not they're not they're not illuminated these are all in darkness some with water and some without uh, the ones with with uh, with the air and water surfaces actually generate the, the hydroxide at the same rate or even faster than sunlight does. Yeah. Um, and so uh, one of the authors says enough of the hydroxide will be created to compete with other known hydroxide sources. And at night, when this is a comment by one of the authors, at night when there is no photochemistry, OH is still produced and is produced at a higher rate than would otherwise happen. Is that so, right? yeah, so it's it's just finding a completely new mechanism for uh, for where this this stuff comes from. Yeah, um, and the, and a surprising one. And I think the thinking is um, that the mechanism involves electrostatic forces. Um, that it's so, uh, kind of static electricity that um, that that actually. Uh, that, that generates it because apparently there is a strong electric field uh, at the surface of water droplets in air. Mm. Uh, now, that is something that I think has probably been known, but not recognized as being strong enough to, to, to sort of mimic in a way the ultraviolet light that comes down from the sun and kick these hydroxide molecules into existence. I, I'm fascinated because I... I... On one hand, I'm thinking, okay, they've discovered this, but obviously it's been a process that's existed for a very, very long time, and yet we're still struggling with um, you know, melting ice caps and sea level rises, global warming, climate change. So discovering this hasn't really changed anything. But then on the other hand, I wonder if the discovery enables us to come up with perhaps an artificial process going forward that might help us clean up our act. Yeah. I, I think that's sort of the thinking behind this. You know, if you can understand where this stuff comes from uh, and you can perhaps generate more than nature does, uh, then, you know, without poisoning the rest of us in the process. Well, that's the other thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. you can clean up the atmosphere. So I, it, it is. It's a, I think it's quite a significant uh, finding. Um, uh, there's some... There's, there's, uh, there's a, a hint that... Um, it, this work will actually lead uh, other scientists to uh, to try and recreate this result. Um, 
So uh, the, there's, a, there's a comment by one of the authors, the next step is to perform carefully designed experiments in the real atmosphere mm. in different parts of the world. Because at the moment, this is all happening in the lab. Uh, but um, yeah, the atmospheric research community is definitely being shaken up. And one of, the, one of the researchers comments, a lot of people will read this, but will not initially believe it. And we'll yeah. either try to reduce it, reproduce it, or try to do experiments to prove it wrong. There will be many lab experiments following up on this for sure. And so, uh, yeah, it's a, a watch this space story, but uh, maybe the, uh, the the key thing is going to be to do, as, as they said, atmosphere, real atmosphere experiments on this OH production. Well, that's science, isn't it? I've made a discovery. No, you haven't. Well, yeah. yes, I have. Check yeah. again. Well, I did yeah. check again, and um, you're not quite right, but that's generally how it goes. How much OH is too much? for us well that's a good point um i guess there is an amount that's too much for us i'm not sure of the physiology physiology of that but yes yes there's uh there's that, that you know all these things come with caveats you don't want to uh suddenly build oh production factories that uh give us give the atmosphere a bad smell for example oh yeah <laughs> although you'd get used to it uh, you might get used to it if you come into you comment about um you know, the experiments um, being announced and then proving people wrong reminds me, and it goes back to the 1980s, of two researchers called Fleischmann and Pons. I don't know whether that, those names mean anything to you, mm -hmm. but they um, wrote papers. They thought they had uh, uh, demonstrated cold fusion, the idea that you can fuse atoms together at room temperatures rather than needing something like the ITER you know, machine that's been built in southern France to, to, to fuse atoms to make essentially free electricity, uh, the, the nuclear fusion process. Yeah. Um, but that, uh, so that caused a lot of excitement at the time. I remember it very well, but um, nobody could reproduce their results. So it, it was, you know, it's been put back in the cupboard as something that maybe a some just some sort of unexpected glitch in the experiment, but nobody can reproduce their results. So cold fusion got knocked on the head with that. Yeah, I, I read about that um, fusion uh, reactor in, in yeah. France. Ether, yes. Uh, at the moment, it's actually requiring more fuel to yeah. produce the electricity than it's actually producing. So um, they haven't achieved uh, equilibrium there yet. But that's that the goal, isn't it? It is, yeah. And I don't think the main machine's finished yet. I think they're mm. still building it. There's, um, I've read reports recently of all sorts of strange, large pieces of scientific stuff wending, wending its way through the back roads of Provence in France, because that's where it is uh, at night so that you don't block up the roads for yeah. the traffic. Yeah. Uh, still on the atmosphere, we, we have talked about in the past, and I know it's something that's it's been toyed with to try and clean up the atmosphere, the uh, creation of artificial carbon scrubbers and pl placing them around the world to try and yeah. clean things up. I don't know if that's ever gotten off the experiment page, but um, that, that could be an option if uh, the OH concept is going to cause us too much trouble, but uh, it's too early to say, isn't it? With OH, it's it's a it's yeah, a lab lab experiment. That's right, and it, it may not necessarily be. You know, the the pollutants that they're talking about are the are the nasties, not not the not particularly the greenhouse. Yeah, um, the greenhouse gases. So carbon scrubbing might be might be an option. Yeah. Well, you know, carbon sequestering that's been talked about as well, putting mm. carbon back in the earth under high pressure uh, there's a lot of ideas well but, one of the one of the things they do out here is they pay farmers to grow trees yeah, which yeah. which holds the carbon yeah. which is okay until you have a massive fire and then it's all gone again it goes back again yeah that's mm. right yeah. but uh, yeah we, we've got um, massive farms even in this district uh, which are designed primarily just to grow timber okay. to hold to hold carbon um, yeah. And they get paid for it, and they get paid rather well, as it turns out. But here you go. Yeah, but this is a yeah really interesting discovery about how Earth cleans itself up and uh, tries to uh, maintain equilibrium in the atmosphere. There's this this just one little wrinkle in that process, and it's called humans, uh, which are kind of <laughs> sort of yeah the pendulum swung too far, uh, and yet there are still those that are debunking it, saying it's not real, no no such thing. I know, I know. Mm. 
Anyway, we'll watch with interest. Hopefully that will develop into something going forward and you can read all about it at the SciTechDaily.com website or uh, get the, uh, go direct to the source of the paper, which will be referenced in that story. It is, this, yeah. yeah. This is Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Okay, we checked all four systems and seeing with a go. Space Nuts. Now we're going to stick to our solar system. We're just going to go from the third rock from the sun to the one that's furthest from the sun, technically speaking. Uh, and um, some new images no. of, we're not going to what? We're we'll talking about Neptune. We're going to Uranus, which isn't the furthest from the sun. <laughs> oh, hang on. Which one are we looking at? The planet Uranus. Ah. See, I wrote Neptune down. I'm a yeah. buff head. <laughs> So oh, that's all right. So we're going to Uranus, which sounds disgraceful. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Um, now, um, some new images from the James Webb Space Telescope of Uranus have been published, and they are stunning, and they're uh, revealing some uh, quite amazing things about uh, the planet that we've only visited, what, once in our history? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. Flyby of uh, Voyager One, I think it was. Yes. Uh, so it's 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 a place we um, and I think we had a question a few weeks ago asking why haven't we been back? When are we going back? Yeah, and there's there's certainly a lot of um, um, enthusiasm within the space community and the planetary science community for going back to Uranus and possibly Neptune as well. Uh, these are missions that are I think still probably decades away. Uh, even and and of course they'll take decades to get there as well, uh, a long time um, because we don't have the the luxury that uh, we had in the seventies of neat planetary alignments that uh, that let you that let you um, catapult spacecraft using the gravity assist method. Mm. So, um, but what's lovely about this story, and uh, I, you I, probably many of our listeners will have seen. Uh, images that were made with the Hubble Space Telescope of the planet Uranus um, decades ago, yeah. showing uh, the planet with its ring looking like a halo around it because, uh, of course, the planet is sits uh, more or less edgeways on in, in its orbit. Its, yeah. its pole is pointed slightly below uh, the plane of its orbit. So we tend to see the rings sort of full on whenever you see them. Quite Quite mystifying when you see it at first because it, Look a bit like Saturn, a depleted Saturn, but tipped on its side. Mm. So, uh, as you'd expect, once it became uh, possible for the James Webb Telescope to image Uranus, because the James Webb, as we've discussed before, can only point in certain directions, it can cover the whole sky in a year, but it can't sort of cover the whole sky at any one time. So, I think what's happened is Uranus has now come into view. And we've got some, as you said, some really stunning observations uh, of of the planet. Um, and what really blew me away, Andrew, is that uh, these observations took uh, 12 minutes of James Webb Telescope. Is that all? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, which is fantastic. Of course, it's a bright object. Uh, and, it's, and it's reasonably close. It's nearby compared with some of the things that uh, the Webb looks at. Mm. Uh, but... Yeah, fabulous uh, stuff. Short, short exposures. They're uh, near infrared images. I think most of them were obtained with the uh, near cam, uh, which is the near infrared imager that um, the web carries. Uh, and and it, these images, of course, show not just the planet and its rings, but also um, many of its moons. Is it twenty-seven moons that Uranus has? I, I lose count with these things because they're. <laughs> it used to be when I think so they could. Two, two they could. When I started astronomy. They might be confused. They mightn't be um, moons. They could be polyps. <laughs> okay. Well, you could. Uh, the, the one good thing about that, Andrew, is that you could have said something worse. No, <laughs> it is. It is twenty-seven known moons, um, and uh, many of them have been captured. You might remember that the moons of Uranus are named after uh, Shakespearean characters. Hmm. Uh, mostly from Midsummer Night's Dream. So notwithstanding all that, uh, what we have is images that show, first of all, I think everybody is captivated by the rings in much finer detail than we've seen. Um, the Hubble images gave you an impression that there was one thin ring around 
uh, around Uranus would yeah. be some inner ones. But this shows beautifully the, the structure of ringlets uh, within the Uranus ring system, very like what we see uh, in the Saturnian ring system, where we've got lots and lots of um, what are, what are called ringlets that that together make up the the, the, the main rings as we see them. Hmm. This is um, yeah, it's stunning. I, I urge you know all our listeners uh, to go and hunt these images out. They're very easy to find. I found them on the Science Alert web- website. Uh, but uh, the rings, uh, and of course, because these cameras on uh, on the Webb telescope have got pretty neat filters on them that let you sift through the light, um, there's probably more coming out of those uh, of those images than we than just looking at them and saying, "Aren't they pretty?" Uh, you know, the structure of the rings, of course, is shown clearly in the images, but there'll be more details that we will find out from. Uh, perhaps some more detailed uh, information that's been secured in those 12 minutes. Um, the other thing that's uh, notable is um, Uranus shows up clouds occasionally in its atmosphere. Yes. Uh, and indeed, there are clouds visible. But there is also um, the the North Polar Cap, mm. which is huge. It's a, it's a, an area of the planet you know, from the visible disk, it covers almost half the visible disk that you can see. Yeah. Uh, and that polar cap, of course, it's not uh, ice like it is on Mars and the Earth uh, because you know, Uranus is a gas giant. So it's something in the gassy atmosphere of uh, of, of Uranus. Uh, and its source is unknown, uh, but what has been spotted from this uh, that hasn't been discovered before is that in the middle of that polar cap, it's actually brighter. Mm. And that's something that hasn't been seen before. So the origin of, of this uh, of this polar cap is something that's going to be um, observed probably more with uh, with the web, if if not uh, more details coming from these present observations. Uh, the polar the polar cap brightens up actually as as the uh, as it faces the sun. In other words, it goes into summer. Because uh, Uranus has seasons, but they're very peculiar ones because it's tilted so far on its side. Yeah, I'm trying to understand why the polar cap is you know, hasn't migrated to the top of the planet, because that's generally the colder part. Yeah, um, but uh, that's absolutely right. But there may be, you know, if you think about um, uh, the uh, rotation of Uranus, uh, a polar cap on the top of the planet will be going around, what is it, it's once every, it's a matter of a few hours, I think, the rotation of Uranus. It wouldn't stay put. Ah, uh, yeah, We'd just keep on going round. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's possible as well that the dynamics of the atmosphere, the movement of gas within the atmosphere is what actually, uh, when, you, when you relate that to the rotation of the planet, that's what causes the polar cap. So it, it's, it's, not, it's, not, but it's not really climatic as such as it is rotational. Yeah, yeah, pro- pro- that's right. Or, Probably or, both. Though. both. But yeah. remember, um, you know, it may be uh, we think of a polar cap as being something cold. Yeah, this one only appears when it's in full sunlight, so it's something different from that. Wow. Uh, so my my guess would be hazes in the upper atmosphere because mm. you see that sort of thing in the atmospheres of of Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, but um, as I said, it's not really fully understood. The chemistry of it's not. Uh, not understood properly, so uh, it's it, it is yes, it is really a st- stunning image, stunning, r- really stunning science that's coming from it. Um, the the clouds themselves speak of storms actually taking place in the atmosphere uh, of uh, Uranus, and there are there are um, the, the scientists who've made these images are just thrilled at the. Uh, the extent, particularly of the rings, how many of the rings it shows. Yes. Apparently it's 11 of the 13 known rings. Of course, the rings were imaged uh, more clearly. Um, and I got it wrong. I said Voyager 1, but it's actually Voyager 2 that, that uh, flew by Uranus in 1986. And that, that discovered um, uh, discovered more more rings, I think, the 13. You know, you, Fred, you wouldn't have made that mistake had you read this book. <laughs> Which book am I looking at? Oh yes, that's the one. Why is Uranus upside down? By 
Fred Watson. Uh, look, well, you're doing it for me. I don't need to mention my own books now. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do. Um, I, you called it a gas giant um, in the article that um, refers to it as an ice giant, yeah. and I've heard that many times. Um, why do why do we sometimes call uh, Uranus and Neptune ice giants? Yeah, it's because there's ice in the atmosphere. That's right. Is that all? Uh, so, so yeah, it, it's yes, it's right. It's um, they're, they're, they're icier than uh, than Jupiter and Saturn. They are gas giants, but they've got a high proportion of ice uh, in the atmosphere, uh, okay. and it, that might again. That might might be something that relates to that polar brightening as well that we were talking about. Mm. So these images, stunning and pretty as they are, will be used to do what quite a bit of science and yeah. to try and learn as much about this uh, planet as we can. It is a really odd place. I mean, you've got to admit, strange, isn't it? <laughs> and and we do need to learn more about it because um, something happened in its deep dark past that caused yeah. it to to flip, to fall over. Yeah. yeah. And that's um, that's one of the, the great... We don't know exactly what happened, do we? No, the thinking is something the size of the Earth, perhaps, clouded it in, its, mm. in the formation of the solar system. Planet, planet Nine. Knocked it over, maybe Planet Nine, yeah. And uh, actually, that's a good suggestion because it may be that whatever hit it uh, in that collision was given sufficient impetus to actually escape the solar system. So it might be a planet that we don't have anymore. Yeah, uh, could be. Or, or indeed... The, the mysterious um, planet nine, which we still don't know whether it exists or not, that's it. Will be in such a peculiar orbit. We think mm. maybe that was the result of a collision too. Planetary dynamicists uh, can can do amazing things by you know tracking back the history of the solar system and looking for um, evidence of that kind of thing. But I don't think there's any compelling evidence. Yet. Yeah, I just like the color of Uranus. Yeah, it is lovely, it's it? beautiful turquoise yeah. color. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely go and have a look at those image, uh, images. I might uh, get Hugh to make that our cover image on this episode because uh, it's, exactly it's good. absolutely stunning. Well, it, it certainly beats a photo of OH. Yes, it does. <laughs> You're right. <Yeah. laughs> mm. But if you do want to uh, uh, find out more about this, uh, uh, these amazing photos, you'll find them all over the web, but the sciencealert.com website is a pretty good destination you will find. Michelle Starr is the author. With a name like that, you couldn't really... Can't go wrong. Make a mistake. <laughs> she's busy. She writes a lot of stuff. Yeah, she's good. Yeah. This is Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Okay, we checked all four systems. And King with a go. Space Nuts. Yes, indeed. Uh, now, Fred, we've got some questions to deal with. Um, most of these are Australian which is interesting. We um, usually get people from all over the world, but uh, they're all text questions as well. This uh, first one comes from Mario, who is in Melbourne. Um, do we need a Big Bang rewrite based on the fact that uh, the James Webb Space Telescope has shown multiple early universe galaxies that are as large as the Milky Way and have red stars in them? A totally unexpected finding and contradictory to Hubble observations and current universe development theories. What does this finding imply? Or is this finding somehow inaccurate? Keep up the great show. I've been listening since the start, by the way. We need more of Fred's dad jokes. Thanks. No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Minor granddad jokes. Are... <laughs> um, <laughs> look... Um, Mario's right. Uh, the web has certainly uncovered some things that stretch the the theories that we have developed for how galaxies evolve and how they uh, how they appear. Um, the, the The red objects, I think, are red galaxies. The red stars are probably beyond the reach even of of Webb, but uh, certainly galaxies that are what you might say perhaps you could say, more evolved than we would expect for such an early phase in the universe. Uh, and this is good. I, 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 nobody's at the moment uh, talking about rewriting the Big Bang because it has so much utterly compelling evidence in support of it. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the fact that uh, you can see it, for a start, in the cosmic microwave background radiation, that is exactly what was predicted, that we would be able to see the Big Bang if it happened, because we can look back so far in time that we can see it. 
Mm-hmm. Yes, we not only have we seen it, but we've measured it and measured the fluctuations in it, the temperature fluctuations that tell you uh, a lot about the early history. So um, in that regard, uh, that plus the expansion of the universe plus the uh, relative abundance of hydrogen, helium, things like lithium in the early universe, which we can observe, uh, they are exactly what you would get from the Big Bang, uh, from the, you know, looking at the physical models for the Big Bang. I think what might be at fault here is our understanding of how rapidly galaxies evolve, how quickly the process takes place of clouds of hydrogen in the cold, dark universe collapsing to, to form stars and then galaxies. And of course, um, uh, many of the uh, big telescope projects <clears throat> currently underway, most notably the Square Kilometre Array, uh, are aimed at exactly that issue. What did the first stars and galaxies look like? What did the universe look like before the first stars and galaxies switched on? Hmm. Uh, and the, in fact, the Square Kilometre Array, one of its tasks will be to map the cold hydrogen throughout the universe in the aftermath of the Big Bang. Uh, and that would certainly add insights to this exact uh, issue. Because if you could see the hydrogen collapsing into you know, proto galaxies uh, early enough, then you you do solve the problems that the the James Webb has uncovered. Didn't we recently talk about a, a discovery or an observation uh, dating back uh, to about three billion years after the Big Bang that showed massive galaxies, and they were trying to figure out why? Was yeah. that what was that? Yeah, yeah, um, that's that's right. So, um, galaxies more massive than you might expect mm. in that early period. Yeah, okay. Um, so no rewriting of the Big Bang, Mario. Uh, too much evidence to suggest that it is, it is what it is and it was what it was and it still is. Um, but, yes, um, there are still some mysteries to unravel. Uh, that's, that's part of the problem, I suppose. Not really a problem, but um, an effect of um, getting bigger and better tools to do observations you start finding things and go, well, okay, we've now got to figure out why that is. Yes. And that's what's, that's what's happening with James Webb. Well, it's what happens with all big telescope projects. What happens when you build something like that or, or you know, something like the Extremely Large Telescope or the SKA, the Square Kilometre Array, you write a case to um, convince the funding agencies that you're going to discover great things. And so you, you have specific questions that you want answered, specific things that you really want to look at, like yeah. the distribution of hydrogen in the early universe. But what actually happens is you build the thing, and it, yes, it does all that, but it uncovers something that was totally unexpected. Mm. And um, that's the sort of rewriting the textbook stuff, um, because because that's when you find things that you you thought you had right, but were wrong. What's the most unexpected thing you've come across in your career? Oh, gosh. Um, That's a good question. It is. Uh, the, yeah, the, um, there are probably lots of candidates for that. And some of the things we've talked about have blown me away because they've been completely unexpected. Um, I'm trying to grapple with them. I mean, I, I do remember uh, back, this is going back decades uh, when we realize that gravity can actually magnify distant objects behind mm. galaxies, gravitational lensing. That was something, I, I mean, Einstein predicted it decades before I got to know about it, but that was very unexpected to me. Um, things like, I'll tell you the other sorts of things as well, Tuna- evidence for tsunamis on Mars. Oh, wow. Um, which we talked about some years ago. There's debris mm. that suggests that at one stage there were tsunamis on, on Mars. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's the the ones that I guess are most intriguing, and perhaps that's one of them. The, the tsunamis on Mars is something that you didn't expect, but when you learn about it, you think, "Why didn't Why didn't I think of that? That's so obvious that something like that should happen." <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you would think so because it used to have water on the surface. It had, yep, um, yep. you know, it, 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 in many ways very similar to Earth on a yes, uh, completely yeah, different yeah, scale. That's right. That's yeah. Right. So it makes sense that that would happen, and it's pro- probably happened on other planets as well. Yeah, uh, if the conditions are right and the circumstances are right. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mario. We're going to go to uh, Mario's neighbour, Kevin, who's also in Melbourne. I'm sure they live next door to each other. It's only a small place. 
Uh, Kevin writes, hi guys, love the show and look forward to it every week. I have a question about the expansion rate of the universe. If the further away we look, the faster things are moving away from us. Doesn't that imply that the further back in time we look, the faster things are moving away from us? And if that's the case, doesn't that imply the expansion of the universe is slowing down? Thanks and keep up the good work, Kev. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so let me just think. We are so we're always looking further back in time. Yes. Um, so uh, yes, the, the the trick is um, that. Uh, it, the, the re, the, basically, that's what we always thought until the 1970s, 1980s, yeah. actually, during the 70s. We thought that uh, the expansion is slowing down. It's not. So uh, you, you've got to separate the two things here. Um, we can look in the local universe and see galaxies receding from, a, from ourselves, all mm. disappearing. And the further you look, further away the, you look, the faster that they're receding. And that's a geometrical thing. Um, it's uh, so when you, but when you start looking uh, at greater distances, and I'm now talking about perhaps five, six billion light years, um, then the effect that uh, Kevin mentions exactly comes into play. And so what you have to do is you've got to use a different yardstick other than the redshift expansion, and that's what. Um, Brian Schmidt and his colleagues uh, and his uh, colleagues over in the United States, two different teams working uh, together on the same problem. That is what they did to discover the accelerated expansion of the universe. They had a different yardstick from just the expansion. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was supernovae. It was standard candles of uh, type 1A supernovae, which explode, we think, always with the same brightness. Yeah. Um, intrinsic brightness and so you can use that you look at how bright it appears and you can you can do that and it turned out that these things uh if i get this the right way around they were further away than expected and that implies that the accel the expansion of the universe has accelerated okay so so it's uh it kevin's thinking's correct uh, but the measurements, you, you've got to have an, a, a, an, another external source rather than just the, just looking at the, sorry, another external uh, yardstick rather than just the expansion of the universe, which is what we normally use as the yardstick for measuring distances. Mm, okay. There you go, Kevin. Just pop next door to Mario and you know, compare notes. You can solve everything for us. Uh, now, we'll move on to another Australian location, not quite near Melbourne. It's Toowoomba, Queensland, and this one comes from Nick. He said, my question is regarding dark matter. I was watching a show about uh, tornadoes and was thinking, how does the twister stay together and not get flung apart from centrifugal force? Um, I then started thinking about the galaxy and how it does not get flung apart, which we presume is because of dark matter. Could the millions of stars inside the galaxy be causing a disruption in space-time inside the galaxy versus space-time outside the galaxy, uh, kind of like a low versus a high-pressure system which assists in the stars not being flung out of the galaxy? Kind regards, Nick. Geez, thought about this. This is lovely thinking, yeah. Mm. I like that very much. Um, so I guess what holds a twister together is the, the intense low pressure yeah. at its centre. Um because it must be there must be a balance of not I'm really giving much thought to that um, but yeah there must be a balance between uh, the outward acceleration caused by the rotation and the inward pull caused by the low pressure mm. um, so so it, it, it even so I think the the answer is that um, you when you look at the galaxy you take these things into account. Um, so if, just remind me, Andrew, was, was, uh, Nick postulating gravitational distortion of space time? Is that what he said? Uh, could the millions of stars inside the galaxy be causing a disruption in space time versus, um, uh, inside the galaxy versus space time outside the galaxy? Yeah. So you, that, that would be something that, uh, the scientists who do this work would have in mind. Hmm. But and even taking that into account, um, there's still not enough mass there to to hold it together. 
So uh, it's a nice an analog, actually, the idea of the low pressure in the middle of a tornado uh, being what what holds it uh, together. Uh, maybe distorted space time in the middle of a galaxy, but there's still not enough in the stars that we can see. And and throwing the black hole as well, you might as well. You get a few million solar masses or billion solar masses there. It's still not enough to hold it together. So there's got to be something else, uh, which is why dark matter was invoked. Okay. And there you go, Nick. So um, yes and no, but more no because of dark matter. Dark matter matters in the scheme of things. Um, it matters a lot. Yeah. It does. It's a, it's a it's a big matter. Um, all right. Uh, wraps up our questions. Although I've got one more little uh, comment here from uh, Todd in Utah. You're going to love this, Fred. Okay. Because we we got a comment asking for more dad jokes from you. I like this. Uh, Todd says, "I'm a new listener. I just wanted to say that I love the show. Also, I learned for myself that space and time are relative. As the more time I spend with my relatives, the more space I need. <laughs> Very nice one. I like that. That's pretty good. It is pretty good. Yeah, I think you should steal that one for your radio show. I could do that, yeah, because it's Dad Joke Friday tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you all. Uh, please keep those cards and letters coming in. Uh, you can uh, go to our website and send us your text or audio questions uh, through the AMA link or uh, the uh, tab on the right-hand side of the homepage if you've got a device with a microphone. It's pretty simple. Uh, mobile phones these days, cell phones for those who don't live in Australia, uh, or uh, or text it. We'll accept them all. Just tell us who you are and where you're from. We love that. And while you're there, have a look around at the shop where you might be able to find this book that I just picked up <laughs> by, by somebody I know. Uh, did he autograph this one for me? No, he didn't. It must have come from your publicist. But anyway, Maybe, yeah, yeah. <laughs> must have. Uh, and, uh, yeah, there's plenty of other things to see and do on our website as well. So check it out, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io. Oh, don't forget our social media platforms. There's the official Space Nuts Facebook page. We've also got an Instagram page. We're on TikTok. We're on Twitter. Uh, and there's the Space Nuts podcast group on Facebook where you can all get together and chat to each other and share your astronomical photos. And, uh, yeah, it's it's a fun site. And, uh, yeah, I've got uh, quite you know, a few thousand people that are uh, signed up to that page these days. Hmm. Fred, that brings us to the end. Thank you so much. Uh, pleasure, Andrew. And, um, well, I look forward to the next one. <laughs> yes, there'll be a next one. Don't know when. Maybe in a week. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Thanks, Fred. Talk to you soon. Sounds great. Take care. Fred Watson, astronomer at large, part of the team here at Space Nuts. Uh, and I'd say thanks to Hugh, but he took a sickie today. Um, I want your note. Don't forget your note, Hugh. Got to have a note or you don't get paid. Uh, that's it from me. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you on the very next episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.